we want to have the right playing conditions out here. That's number one. The greens primarily. I think in the history of golf, anybody from old Tom Morris to Harry Colt, they always tried to make the greens better. For the rest of it, with a bit of luck and some experimentation, I don't see any reason why our mowing costs, fertilizing costs, irrigation costs, why they couldn't be a fraction of what they otherwise would be if we had made different choices and if we had different values. My name is James Duncan, and I'm part of Brambles. I've worked with Bill Coo and Ben Crenshaw for many years, working in golf course design. And in the last six, seven years, I have been doing some work on my own, and then also been part of this project. Brambles came to be from, if you had one chance to build a golf course, put together a project, assemble a group of people, what would it look like? What would you do? Well, the underpinnings of the project came from the UK about this sort of less is more, where it was match play and it was all about having as much fun as you could. It's this simple, unadulterated exploration into nature. That was a big part of the sort of UK model that we tried to, to bring in. If we wanted everything to be quote unquote perfect, then that's a different proposition. If we got this place too perfect, it would, wouldn't look right, it wouldn't feel right. I think the golf is really a cross-country adventure, and I think that's a great way to think about it. It's tight in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tyler Marcotte, and I'm the golf course superintendent at the Brambles. I would describe the agronomy program as unique. Our goals are different than other places. We don't have this lust for lush green, kind of postcard picture golf course. We want it to play better than we want it to look. The playing conditions for the golf course are very, very important to us. The old timers talked about the keenness of the ground and the run of the ball. Let's really try and bring that back or bring that to bear on this property where we are going to try and get this thing as dry as we can, as fast as we can, and just let the ball run like a jackrabbit. And the zoysia grass that we picked was picked for those reasons. We have zoysia grass. So we have Xeon zoysia in the tees and fairways. Now we have a prism zoysia on the greens. It's unique to the area for sure. I mean, the prism on the greens is unique in the country. It's not something that a lot of guys have. I have trouble trying to find guys to bounce ideas off of with the prism. There's just not a lot of exposure to it. Not a lot of guys use it, especially on golf courses right now. People in the turf community said, this is crazy, this is not gonna work. But zoysia, like Bermuda grass, is, is a warm season grass and won't require irrigation in the summertime. It's low input, so I mean, it doesn't take a lot once you get it in and we're not going to over fertilize it. We've noticed on some of the stuff that's grown in more over the past two years, we can, you can get away with not watering for a pretty long time. You know, ben Crenshaw used to joke that um, the worse you treat this stuff, the better it does. And of course, that's an overstatement in the sense that you don't want to be, you know, fumigating it, but it's a bit like trying to grow fescue or bent grass by the seaside. You got salt spray and it's not ideal from a grass growing point of view, but the, the way that the grass sort of struggles to survive is ideal from a golf point of view. If we can just get it established, we feel like it is the closest you can get to the seaside conditions that you might find in the UK, you might find in Bandon. And I'm hoping what we can achieve here is we can put out less water than anyone's really ever heard of. So we have 50 sheep and some sheep dogs out there. I was always serious about it. And I think, you know, the sheep, it's unusual, but it's genuinely to try and get 
the roughs, unlike any other roughs you've seen, in, certainly in California. The ultimate goal on our end is to keep machinery away and let let the animals do their thing. And what we've noticed when we've had them out kind of grazing through the natives the past few years, it just looks better than what a mower will do. It looks less fabricated. It blends it in with nature a lot better. If there was a mechanical way that we could have roughs the way I think the sheep will wind up mowing them, we'd probably give that a try. But until that happens, I think the best bet is to see what we can do with sheep. My name is uh, Ryan Player, um, and I'm the ranch manager at Brambles. So it's not easy. You can't really just go in and drop them and expect them to do what you want them to do. But it's kind of like training a dog. You have to train your, your sheep. You want them to be able to know that there's fences, and you want them to go in these certain areas, and you don't want them in other areas, especially on a golf course. So an area before they're there, especially in, in the area we're in in Northern California, you're looking at two feet tall native grasses and they'll come in and they'll just graze it. Now, depending on the size of the pen, a lot of the ones that we've set up, they're just anywhere from 15 to 20 acres. They can be in there for anywhere from like three to five weeks and they'll just graze and then they'll poop and do their thing and it just creates this natural regenerative process and then actually you do that for a couple of years and you end up with better feed for them. Once you come back, you know, we're just getting started with it. But in three to four years, you're going to come back and it's just going to be more lush, better grass for, for them to, to feed on. They'll end up leaving little tufts of plants that stick out on their own that you can't replicate with a weed eater. And even months later, the stuff that they left gets taller, it gets more yellowed out, and it stands out that much more. My plan for getting the sheep out on the golf course over the next couple of years is really kind of like what we have set up. These 15 to 20 acre permanent fenced in areas that'll just kind of be just outside of the rough areas and, and try to, you know, get them trained on, you know, moving around. And then we'll have some areas that we might not fence in and we can let them out of these pens, um, you know, with herding dogs and just, just try to move them around the golf holes and the greens and tees and fairways the best we can. Well, the long-term goals with the sheep are, are, like the zoysia, a little bit of a moving target. We're not quite sure what's possible, but let's make sure that we try. And then, in addition to that, it, it adds something intangible, again, about property management, about having animals on property. Uh, Ryan, who works with us and does a fabulous job with the animals, I mean, he loves those critters. He loves the dogs, he loves the sheep. So that energy as well, that being part of the puzzle, it fills me with joy that we have animals out here and we take care of them and they do something for us and does this symbiosis. It's joyful to me. It's a uniquely California experience. You know, look around you, the, the, the landscape, the scenery, the, again, the weather. Uh, and I love that, that we have tried to take UK elements of golf history, golf tradition, golf customs, culture. But by virtue of it being where it is, it has its own identity. I, I love that. We're not trying to do this as some great experiment to, to, to hopefully you know, see if it works out. If people come out here, they, they say, well, we can see what you're doing, but it doesn't really apply to us, so we're not interested. That's fine too. We're not trying to sort of pioneer some, some effort here. This is something that we believe in and would like to do, uh, but we'll see what the, what the effects will be. Mm -hmm.